Shut up and sit down. All right, everybody, welcome back to Rebel Trading Group Podcast, episode 46. My name is the gluten free Jason Bessing, and apparently I'm going to have to run it solo today, and we're going to dip into that in just a quick second. First of all, I want to apologize for the delay in an episode. I know it's been a while. It's been over a week. Mr. Nathan, my rock, was affected by Hurricane Michael and is... Everything is okay. Everything's good. Back at the house, there was a time where he was unable to return to his house because the highways were shut down. Uh, He also has no internet, making this very hard to do. So... I hope everything is okay. Uh, He's doing well. Hopefully he's going to be back with us soon. But it was just time to get some fucking content out there to you guys, to you people. So thanks for being with us. Thanks for being patient. Uh, I know you probably didn't miss us too much. But anyway, uh, today is Wednesday. My dudes. October 17th, 2018. Um... Shit, we haven't been here in almost two weeks. So, um, I'm going to interrupt real quick. I just saw, I'm watching Bloomberg, and Uber IPO was just offered at $120 billion. So, I just wanted to throw that out there real quick. I'm not going to, I'm not going to... I'm not going to dip too much into that. That might be something for a future discussion with Nathan. That's something I would want to brush over. But today, like I said, I just wanted to get some content out to you guys. I wanted to talk a little bit. I wanted to make you listen to me ramble. So that being said, let's go ahead and start with the numbers for the day. We had a volatile day. It's been a volatile past week. The Dow dropped almost 600 points in a single day, and we didn't even get to come on this podcast and talk about it. So we've had a humongously volatile week, Uh, and that's just kind of expected. There's a theory that volatility exists in the fall, closer to August, September, October, because people withdraw from 401k plans, 529 plans, and personal accounts in order to fund their children's education, whether it's college or private school. So that's a theory. I don't know if it's true. Uh, It sounds pretty accurate, though. Why get a loan for 20 G's to fund your kid's tuition if you've got it just chilling in an account for them? A lot of parents were smart. A lot of parents think. So that is one of the theories, and of course, we've always got to slap a news article or a headline to every single day and why movement happened the way it did. And one of those narratives, if you will, is rising interest rates. And we're going to talk about that today. I want to dip on that a little bit more in the coming hour or so. Um, so we have had extreme volatility. I'm sorry, I just keep rambling, but we're going to go back to the numbers now. Dow sitting at 25,706, down 91 points today after a nice 500 point pop yesterday. S&P 500, I'm not even going to call that down a point. NASDAQ down three points. Uh, we did have some movement. We looked at about a 250, 300 point swing today on the Dow, our favorite index here at the Rebel Trading Group, the Dow fucking Jones. Gold sitting at 1,225, having a slight rise up from that 1,200 range, but gold doesn't move that much, and oil sinking down to $70 a barrel. I had a decent day. I had a volatile day. I dipped all the way down 4%. And right at 11.15, she decided to take a U-turn, and I basically ended sideways on the day. It was painful to watch and relieving to watch at the same time. I noticed that the markets were taking a bit of a swing in all kinds of directions this morning. So I put some debit spreads on. I put some credit spreads on on some of my favorite stocks. And I also put a hedge on just in case uh, we see some more of that volatility throughout the week, which I can expect that we might have. So 
Those are your current numbers. That's where we're sitting at on the day. Jason Bessing, the gluten-free one, down 1% on the day. Whatever. Uh, Let's go ahead and pop on over to market terminology. Uh, Today, what is the float? The float. It's not one of those instant metrics that you see when you first pull up Yahoo Finance or your broker or Robinhood. It's not one of those first ones you see. But it's one of my favorite metrics because it helps put things into perspective. So what is the float? Huh? Mm -hmm. Well, let me take a sip of this Deep Eddy vodka and I'm going to get you the answer. So when a stock IPOs, it will have a certain amount of shares that it will offer. It might be a million shares, it might be a billion shares at a dollar, it might be 355 million shares, whatever. It's a lot. It's always in the millions, if not billions, when it first IPOs. Well, throughout the course of time, some of those shares get bought back, they even get destroyed, and some of them even add on extra shares after their IPO. So the float In order to get the float number, you have to understand those shares outstanding is how many shares the company has issued out into the public. That is the shares outstanding. How many shares are actually out there? How many shares have been created? How many segments of that is that company divided into? So just to use, an, we're going to use an easy number here. Remember, like I said, it's always in the millions, if not billions. I wouldn't be surprised as soon as we see some trillions. So once you know the shares outstanding, you can understand what the float is. The float is how many of those shares that exist are actually available to the public because like I said some companies will buy them back and when they buy them back they withhold them within their own inventory they don't pay earnings they don't pay dividends to those stocks they basically take them out of the float They're floating around out there they take them out of that so what's the advantage for a company to take shares out of the float well like I said they don't have to pay dividends to those shares those shares um, are no longer part of that EPS metric because they're basically deactivated. So if Disney, I'm just going to use easy numbers, has 100 shares and they decided to buy back 20 of them or just to make it easier, they buy back 50 of them, right? They buy back half their shares. Well, if they have a $2 EPS one year, and then they buy back 50% of their shares, well, the following year, they're going to have a $4 EPS or, or earnings per share. And if you don't understand that, you can go to back to our last episode to get the refresher on that. So taking it out usually pushes uh, volume up. It also, not volume, I'm sorry, it pushes the price up. It gets rid of weak sellers, gets rid of sell orders, And it basically shakes off weakness. So um, I didn't really mean for it to take that path, but we took a path a little bit into stock buybacks there. And that's something we can talk about some other time. But bringing it back, the float is simply the number of shares that are available to be bought in the open market not to be bought, or are actually out there, whether they're being held or they're in the market to be sold or bought. So I hope that makes sense. If you have any more questions about the float or even stock buybacks, um, email us, rebeltradinggroup at gmail.com. That's rebeltradinggroup with two Gs at gmail.com. And my name is the gluten-free Jason Bessing. So, before we jump into today's topic, I always like to remind people, I know I said it a million times, but the reason that this show exists is to act as the funnel 
of information, of everything that we've learned, of everything we've compiled together through our years of trading errors and fuck-ups and looking up definitions and researching videos and beating things into our head over and over and over and over until they finally make sense. And we wanted to act as that funnel that really kind of compiles that all into you and we deliver it to you guys. So I I want to build that community of learning investors because I am one myself. We're always learning. And that's one of the reasons I love the markets is because they're constantly changing. There's always new doors to open. And when you open one door, there's four more. And then you go in that one, then there's four more. So uh, I just, I appreciate everybody that listens, but we, we welcome your feedback. Talk to us, get out there, uh, email us. We're on stock Twit, SoundCloud, YouTube, Facebook. We're there. We might not be very active in it, but we promise you, if you send us something, we'll get back to you. And, uh, so yeah, so let's talk into today's topic. I don't really have a topic. (laughs) Funny enough, today's topic is really no topic, but there are several points that I wanted to, um, kind of go over some interesting thoughts. Um, we've had, we've had a lot of market volatility recently, And like I said, there's that theory that is that there's massive sell-offs to fund education in the fall time when everybody goes back to school and back to college. That's one of the theories out there. So that has manifested itself over the past few, I'll say the past couple weeks. So we've seen a lot of volatility on the Dow in the Dow, on the Dow. And you know that is both Nathan and I's favorite metric because that kind of, I like to say they're the leaders of the economy. The Dow Jones represents 20% of the U.S. stock market. S&P about 80. Uh, So I like to watch the Dow. It's also easier to keep track of 30 companies. And because there's less companies, there's more room for movement. And that's why we saw that volatility. So on those risk-off days where there's a little bit of a tumble and it just starts to create a snowball effect, if you notice uh, last week when we were shedding points, it was a couple hundred every 15, 20, 30 minutes or so. It was 100 here, down 100 here. We were down 500. We're down 650. We're down 7. We're down 8. We closed down 650 for the day. It just it keeps going, that snowball effect. And those are risk-off days. When investors and Wall Streeters are kind of readjusting from those riskier stocks, especially the NASDAQ stocks, technology, um, I guess some of those quote-unquote communication companies. Facebook and Google will always be technology companies to me. They're not going to be communication companies. But for the sake of this, I'm going to call them technology companies. When those investors flock from those, they tend to go into utilities, consumer staples, or some other sort of quote-unquote safer riskier, I'm sorry, less risky investment like gold or silver or commodities in general, maybe even oil. So we've seen that. It's finally been here. We've been having this sort of uptick that's been questionable. We've had a questionable uptick, I think is the best way to put it, because everybody's been going up and we've been proceeding with caution. We finally have a large sell-off, and we start to rebound from that. And for the first time in the past year, I think we are finally able to put those that rally back, that small rally back that hasn't been confirmed yet, I think we're ready to put that on earnings. For the first time in about a year, maybe a year and a half, we're finally talking about the earnings that companies are putting out. Banks have put out good numbers. They're not doing 
incredible. They're doing better than we thought. They're reporting um, lesser inflation than expected. And the rates don't seem to be hurting them as much. And that's a good sign for our earnings season. So the banks, on a 1 to a 10, they did about a 6 or a 7 so far. We still have a long ways to go. The banks always kind of kick things off. We're going to see how the rest of the S&P does. Tesla. Uh, I'm very curious how Apple and Microsoft do, if they're going to just keep it. Because if they do well, they're going to push this rally higher. Uh, we had Netflix yesterday. That's kind of my next topic that I wanted to talk about. Netflix. Fuck. Today, she went up. She's sitting at the 400 mark, just about. Um, sorry, if you give me just a second. I'm trying to pull up her chart. I'm trying to get the exact price for you. There she is. She's up 5.28% today, gapping up to $365. Uh, And that's on the back of earnings. Uh, Quote, unquote, from CNBC, smashes earnings. Um, They respected 68 cents. They made like 86 cents, if I'm not mistaken. No, 89 cents they made. And they also mentioned that they increased their user subscription rate. And for Netflix, that's probably their most important metric. Remember, companies always have certain metrics that they've got to kind of abide by. Like retail um, is same-store sales. Airlines are seat miles. Hotels is RevPAR, revenue per available room. So Netflix is going to be all about its subscription base because that's its source of revenue. It's not ads, that's for sure. Um, so Netflix continues to go up and up and up and up. And I even sent out a little message when I traded Netflix in May 10th, 2016, a little screenshot of my account, bought her at 91.42 and 10 days later I sell her at 92.01. Gone up 400% since then. That was about two and a half years ago. Painful to see that. Absolutely painful to see that. But here's my thing. Like I said, they made 89 cents a share this quarter. The stock price, $365 a share. The P.E. ratio, 166.5. For every $166, you're getting a dollar back from the company. It's not a strong return. The cash flows and the return on investment doesn't match what the stock price is. But here's the bitch about it. Regardless, it goes up. It continues to go up and up and up and up because of that sales growth. It commands that high P.E. I don't think it justifies it. But that's the reason that it's so highly priced, because it keeps beating expectations. It keeps doing better. It keeps going up. It keeps gapping up $65 a share overnight because of earnings. It it, it keeps doing it. So regardless of the PE, regardless of the financials, the stock price is monstrous. Here's the thing, though. The second that they that these earnings start to slide and the growth starts to slide as competition increases, Netflix is going to plumb it. Plumb it. And it's going to get hit so hard. The problem is, is we don't know when that's going to be. And nobody nobody does know. I think Disney's going to come in and shake up that Netflix market. And I hope they do. I hope they come in cheaper and better. And just puts. Ne- I, I think I'm going to put on a short on Netflix when that happens. I think it's supposed to be January or February. I will probably short Netflix, grow the balls, get some cojones going, man. We're going to short the Netflix, man. The fucking NASDAQ mover du jour. Shorted Apple last week and got fucked. I tried to go for a third day of downtrend on the NASDAQ, and I just got absolutely fucked. Separate story, though. So, that's my thoughts on Netflix. 
I'd like you to share them with us. It's it's one of those stocks that I just can't bring myself to do, but it continues to do well. My next topic, is it time to short Snap? Is it time to short Snapchat? They've never made any money. Let's pull them up. SNAP. Snap. Everybody knows who Snapchat is. They've never made money. Their stock never made money. I'm sure their CEO and all the founders have made plenty of money. Founded 2011. Nine billion dollar market cap IPO'd last year, and year to date we are down, or in the past year we're down fifty six percent. Fifty seven. I'm gonna call it fifty seven percent. Sorry, IPO'd in December twenty third of two thousand sixteen. I thought people were thought they were gonna have a nice Christmas because of that one. Whoo! And and they might have popped up to twenty seven on March, and then all the way down to seven dollars and six cents a share. Personally, this is one of those scumbag stocks. If you go back to long, go back like months, I talk about scumbag stocks. Snapchat's turning into one of them. It's it's. It does have a, a name that I guess you could say commands respect. I guess you could say it commands respect. But the fucking valuations don't command shit. doesn't command a buy. It commands a short sell. And that's what I want to talk about today. I am considering taking a short position on Snap, mostly through calls, um, bearish calls. And I just, it's never made money. It's not projected to make money. I just, it's got good volume. There's no dividend. But it just keeps going down and down and down and down. I don't like their business model. First of all, I fucking hate the platform. I don't use it. I deleted it. It was fun years ago. Then they fucked it all up. I don't like the platform. I don't like when you just shove ads in someone's face. I mean, some people might be able to sit through that, but I cannot, I will delete your shit like that. I am not, I don't, no, don't shove ads in my face when I'm trying to interact with your product. I get it that there needs to be ads, but they don't need to be constant. I don't know. It's just, it's not, it's not my business model. It doesn't roll with me. It's losing money. It's hemorrhaging money. Horribly down 70% since it's IPO. 70! And nothing I can say except I don't think that this will be a stock in three years. So I don't think Snap is by. I think it's time to short Snapchat. Let's talk about other things that have been beaten up. Can we pop on over to the IWM? That is the Russell 2000 Index. It's one of those weirder indexes because the Russell Index as a whole takes into account the 3,000 largest stocks that publicly trade in the United States. Of that 3,000, they take the bottom 2,000 smallest, and they call it the Russell 2000. So it is regarded as a small cap index, and it is a way to play smaller businesses. So in short, obviously, the Russell is going to do well in a booming economy when businesses are able to expand. Um, Bigger businesses are buying out smaller businesses, and there's new sectors and new emerging markets that kind of sort of to manifest there, that's when the Russell's going to do well. Right now, Russell is getting cucked, as the youth like to say. On the month, we're down 7.5% on the small cap index. And five, uh, I'm sorry, past one year, only up 7%. We hit all the way near a high in August at about 172. We're sitting at 158. Not a major movement, but for an index and an index fund, it might be time to kind of look into this. Um, if you have a 10-year outlook, absolutely, right there. Buy this pullback for sure. If you're if you five-year outlook. Coming out of the recession, this is probably going to be the top performing um index 
But for the time being, she's struggling with, um, she's struggling with price movement <laughs> going up. That's what she's struggling with. Um, not, I wouldn't say it's an arbitrary index, but she's she's got a nice pattern on. If you look at that five year, she's got a nice just trend line going right up. And I know you can't see my computer screen. I'm not all I can't do all that voodoo shit Nathan does with the Twitch and stuff. But I think if you have a five to ten year outlook, this is the time. Uh, I think if you have a six month outlook, it's time to short. I could see this going down back down to the 145 147 range uh pretty f- fairly easy and the reason i say that is because of my next topic the rising interest rates so rising interest rates are not good for small businesses who are hev- heavily levered in order to aggressively expand as the Joker says, there's always room for aggressive expansion. And that's, he's absolutely right. But when it comes to being a business, at the end of the day, you've got to put the money up. And I think that the rising interest rate environment is causing not necessarily a struggle in the small cap businesses, but some pullback in the stock price. Some investors kind of fleeing, getting out of there, looking for safer things to go to. This is definitely a risk on asset. I just typed I just talked about going risk on and risk uh, ooh, talked about going risk on and risk off. Um this is definitely a risk on asset, small caps. Um but those rising interest rates are going to hurt them and if we enter a recession with increasing rates, this index is going to get hit the hardest. Now today we once again, I saw one of those bullshit headlines that, of course, just has to attach a story to something. It was something along the lines of the Dow, the Dow Jones down 200, or what? how many points was it for the day? Uh, let me see if I can get the thing here. Yeah, there it is. Dow Jones down 100 points on the day at on a volatile session due to hint of raised interest rates. Well, no fucking shit. They're going to hint raising interest rates. This is the most transparent Federal Reserve we've ever had in history. Because not only are they, do we know that they are going to raise rates, they're telling us exactly when the fuck they're going to do it. And in the September meeting, when they raised it a basis point, they said that they're going to do it again in December. Because somehow they're seeing a strong economy that is just booming, regardless of the deficit. And they're going to continue to raise rates because of that, in order to prevent inflation. So, that being said... CNBC, of course, got to attach one of them bullshit headlines to it saying that the Dow moved today because of interest rates being raised in December. We already knew this. If you watch the market daily, we knew this, maybe even weekly. We knew this. The Federal Reserve is very transparent in their agenda these days. In the 60s, 70s, Nixon era, not so much. When we abolished the gold standard and they were pushing up interest rates, uh, the, f- the chairman of the Federal Reserve was named Volger. Volger. And he, there was no transparency under him. They would just come out and then say what they're doing and then retreat to Jackson Hole, Wyoming for three more months. And apparently one time they came out and instead of raising it one basis point, which a basis point with the Federal Reserve is 0.25% on the federal rate. So when they increase rates one basis point, it's 0.25%. When they do a full, um, they came out one time in the 70s and did a full 1% gain in a single day. During 2008, they did a half a point. Um. So two basis points. So there was no transparency back then. But I think the transparency today is to kind of prepare investors and businesses alike in order to not be surprised 
when the next recession comes. And some companies are playing defensively, like Ford. You know, my favorite company, Ford Motor Company. They are playing very defensively by cutting all production except their F-150s and their Mustangs and some of their Lincoln vehicles. But other than that, they decided to cut down production, cut down costs, because they know these rising interest rates are going to hurt automobile sales in the next two years. And a recession goes, the automobile sales go. People aren't spending money. They're not out to buy a new car. If the money, if if wallets, if the wallets a, a little, a little skinny, you're not going to go out and buy a new car. Hopefully, most most people aren't. Some people are. You need to get a new car. Fuck it. So, I wanted to share my thoughts with you guys today. I hope that you enjoyed my spiel on those four things. Um, I'm gonna kind of wrap it up for the day. I do miss you, Nathan. It's a lot less fun without you. But for today, um, or for the rest of the week, what am I watching? Wow. Well, uh, let's go pop on over to the old watch list and I'm going to get you that answer. I sold some puts. I sold a put on L Brands at the $30.50 strike price, and I'm kind of hoping that she holds above that. She's still got about a 3% dip. I think that she continues to be very undervalued between the P.E. ratio and the dividend, and I like her as a long-term play. So um, until she kind of rockets off, I'm thinking about kind of selling weekly or maybe monthly kind of selling some puts on her until she kind of takes off selling out of the money puts is always fun for stocks that if you don't think it's going to go to if you don't think it'll dip down to this price then you would sell that put that put in order to collect the premium um 30 30 dollars 50 cents was a very strong one i also sold some i i locked in the profits but i also liked the chart of nokia on the five year if you if you're able to pull her up somewhere close to this date, you pull her up on the, I'm sorry, uh, not the five-year, the one-year. Pull her up on the one-year chart. She seems to be putting in some strong resistance at that $5 range. She's back up to five fifty now. So I'm looking to um, kind of continue to collect premiums within this volatile market. I like to collect premiums. Um, if things sell off, I think that some other things are not going to get hit as hard, and those are the things I'm looking to put time decay in my favor. Um, I'll kind of collect money from the hedgers out there. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, insults, or ideas, or corrections, did I say corrections? Questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, insults, corrections, or ideas, you can email us at rebeltradinggroup at gmail.com. That's rebeltradinggroup with two G's at gmail.com. Dot, dot com. Gmail. G, G, gmail.com. Fuck. Have another drink, Jason. We're also on Facebook, SoundCloud, YouTube. YouTube has an archive of all of our videos. All of our podcasts are available to you for free on YouTube. They're always going to be. Always going to be. And little does Mr. Nathan know that I have been kind of busy jotting down some ideas and some notes on some things that we might bring to the table next year. So, I, uh, I love you, Nathan. I whipped out the surprise solo episode on your ass. I do miss you. I hope you get your internet back. And, uh... I hope to hear I hope to get back to you guys again on Friday. But if not, thanks for listening. Happy trading. Good luck and may the volatility gods be ever in your favor. Mm-hmm.